whilst we have a quick moment, if you would like to get out of panel mode and into pitch mode and want to see some of the pitching startups or some of the presentations in the second room, now would be a time to switch locations. Here we will have another panel that will last till 12.30 until we go for a lunch break. And um, this panel will be on the ICO market and how it's heating up. Um, I think what we've heard time and again is that it's incredibly, uh, an incredibly exciting time, surprising has been a word that was used, um, a surprising time to be in cryptocurrency um, space. But I think it's also really important to see through the hype. And I want to have a quick show of hands um, just to kind of get a sense of what the audience thinks. Um, who thinks the ICO market is overheated and hyped up right now? And hands up. All right. And um, who thinks it's just the beginning of something that's going to radically change the internet and the world as we know it today. All right. So we have on both sides about 50% who think it's a complete hype, 50% who think it's going to change the world, and sometimes both. So um, just for, for you to have a sense of where, where we're here at in the audience. Now, um, I did a little bit of research. There just came out a, an article on September 13th in the Financial Times and uh, the title was To Coin a Craze, and I'm going to quote it here. Um, ICOs have turned into the year's most striking financial craze. More than 1.7 billion, we already know this, have been raised through ICOs. And Jamie Dimon, the chief executive at J.B. Morgan, said, this is, this is crazy. Um, if J.P. Morgan employees are going to be trading um, any kind of cryptocurrency, they might be fired. On the other side of things, you got Tim Draper as a VC saying, no, 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 no. This is much like the internet early on. It could be bigger than anything we've ever seen. And we're going to be, at the end of this, we're going to come out in a much more affluent and fair world once the dust settles. So ICOs, according to Tim Draper, are filling in where governments have failed. Now, this is exactly at the intersection of what the upcoming panel is going to be discussing. Um, and I'm just going to have a quick look. I think we're getting a hands up. Yes, we can go. Um, our moderator for the panel is going to be from uh, Swisscom Blockchain, the CEO himself, Daniel Houdenschild. Um, Daniel the stage is yours. We have a clock ticking here to make sure we all get on our lunch break in time. Brilliant. Then we have our four panelists. Richard Castellain, please come up on stage. And um, then we have, uh, he's the co-founder of Crypto Assets Design Group. Yeah. Welcome. Daniel Zacherson, co-founder of co-found.it. Co-found it. Welcome. Alexander Ivanov, CEO and founder of the Waves platform. Welcome to the ICO Summit stage. And Miko Matsumura, partner at Pantera Capital. So with that, yeah. have a fantastic panel and thank you. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks yeah. a lot. Um, thank you guys uh, for joining me on stage today. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's obvious by just the number of people in this room, and, and there was Finance 2.0 conference yesterday. We see that uh, if it's not a bubble, there is certainly an extreme acceleration in, in what we see moving towards uh, uh, this type of funding for, for, for new ventures and new startups, and, and that has positives and negatives. Um, and maybe just to kind of set the stage and see what the backdrop of this. Uh, I mean, Richard, you you've, you've are in touch with uh, you know, most of the launch pads uh, in, in the ICO world, and you've seen, uh, you've seen some of this acceleration. Can you give it a little bit of a perspective on how you see this happening and what's going on? Well, I, test, test, test. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> I think probably one of the most interesting things that I'm seeing at the moment is this transition from uh, you know, the idea that we really need to have... Uh, non-compliant ICO. Uh, I'm just pointing out recently Kick, for instance, which I participated in, not Kick ICO, but Kick, the, uh, the IM platform, 
where they actually did, did a basic KYC AML for their whitelist. And they have 15,000 people signed up. So we're also seeing the same with Kyber Network in, out of Singapore. They actually signed up 50,000 on their whitelist. And they had a basic KML, uh, KYC AML uh, procedure for that. So now we're kind of breaking beyond the idea that all this needs to be underground and anonymous or you won't, the whales won't invest to some kind of uh, feeling in the community that, hey, you know, we can gather basic information on people and start to keep the regulators a little bit more happy. And uh, the, the whitelist phenomenon I really like as well because what they're doing now is they're opening up, uh, for instance, on Kick, uh, uh, they're opening up a, 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 pre a, a, a pre-sale kind of thing where so many people can invest only so much. So if you're on the whitelist, you maybe can invest like 15 ETH or whatever it is, maximum. And they're allowing a lot of people to participate. And then after 24 or 48 hours of this period where they're, they're, they're putting all their whitelisters through, then they open it up to people can invest as much as they want and the whales can come in after that and participate. So they're really trying to figure out these problems that, for instance, we had with BAT or the Brave token, where they had 300 uh, investors uh, it was gone in, in minutes, and uh, the goal of BAT was really to create a community. That's what we want to do as ICO founders. We want to build communities. We want to have 12,000. We want to have 15,000 people. That's what builds the network. That's what the network effect is. So when you are doing something like Brave, which we all learn from, the BAT token, and wow, they only got 300 people. It was gone like that. They're not able to really have that community to start with. So I always, you know, from my perspective... It really comes down to community and the art of community building that makes this work. And the people that are able to do that are the most successful ICOs. Brilliant. Thank you. I mean, uh, Daniel, you, you also yeah. have, uh, you know, you have, I guess the, the, the trick is now, I mean, there's obviously this type of attraction, this type of acceleration. You, you, you will get people who are just going to take a punt, right? And, and then the, 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 the art of it becomes, you know, how do you separate... Um, you know, the series, the good that will walk kind of through this uh, valley, untouched, unscathed, uh, you know, by, by any effects because they just have the fundament fundamentals right. Uh, how, how, how do you go about uh, selecting? Yeah, <clears throat> so selecting is, is one thing, but also remember that it's, it's, we do selection, the projects we work with, but it's also up to the big crowd that actually are supporting these projects. So they must learn to do selection and due diligence themselves. And we can see that there are a number of success factors behind crowd sales and how, how do you make a successful project. Like it goes down to three basic parts. Uh, authority, credibility and community. You really need to develop all of these aspects uh, well as a project. And you need to work on it post crowd sale as well. Uh, so and, and it goes. We can we can delve deeper into this, but as a as a introduction, I think that's good. Yeah, and, and so I mean, it's obviously that you know this 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 attention that it's attracting, um, uh, this acceleration in, in this form of funding is 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 creating almost its own industry, right? Um, I mean, Miko, uh, you have some views. Is this is the hype? good for ICOs and, and token and cryptology in, in general? Yeah, so I have, I have three initial comments. So first of all, uh, I'm with uh, Pantera Capital. So we raised a $100 million dedicated ICO-only fund. So I, I just wanted to say that first because I'm about to say a few negative things, but I want to make sure that people understand that fundamentally... You know, Pantera is exceedingly bullish on the ICO concept to the tune of like many millions of dollars. So, you know, we plan to invest and it will be uh, great. So returns will be had. Um, but with bearing that in mind, I think the other things that I'd like to say is at the moment, uh, ICO seems to be an attempt to decentralize, prematurely decentralize uh, Silicon Valley venture capital without solving the problem of trust at a distance. And so I think with that problem, I think what we have is we have a market that is probably about 90% uh, bullshit and about maybe actually less than 10% uh, quality. So I think that the deal flow has gone through the roof and it's just insane how many uh, ICOs there are. But uh, I think the last thing I just wanted to comment is, is that you know, those who are studying the phenomenon, 
by looking at the blockchain directly can tell you that the typical form of an ICO is a power distribution of ownership, a power law distribution. And so if you look at that, you, know, you begin to understand the dynamics of market making whale power. So I think uh, you know, for, for those people in the room doing ICOs, uh, it's probably worth noting that uh, you, know, you should probably consider raising in pre uh, up to half of what you plan to raise in total. Uh, anyhow. Um, interesting, interesting but market. Can I, uh, two things I'm thinking about <laughs> immediately. That you say deal flow, but it's also on a global market, and we've we're growing from a very very small community where it was you could count and you could know each each product that came out there. What's happening now is we see this expand on a global level and still. <coughs> 200 ICOs maybe next month on a global level. If you see 200 startups coming out, raising from seed money all the way, because ICOs are also from early seed money all the way through, through Series B. Uh, so we're just seeing the start, I, w I would say also. And, and it will continue to grow. But what we need to do is also to categorize this and let this whole space mature. So, yeah. So we understand what is the purpose of each project and each crowd sale out there, and what are they trying to achieve? Uh, and that's maybe an interesting point, to Alexander. I mean, obviously, uh, the yeah. man who needs almost no introduction, uh, you, you certainly must be excited about uh, you know the the uh, the onset in, in this. I mean, do you do you consider the platform that you've built? Do do you have any? requirements of uh, minimal viable product or do you select or do you say it's open for everything that's oh, not it, our job actually no because we are just like a normal blockchain like an ethereum so we can't filter uh, projects so it's totally decentralized and i think it's important now to have some kind of maybe self-regulation because what is happening now is just some kind of attempts to self-regulate the market what we can see now is white lists and stuff like that so people are trying to uh, offer something uh, like transparent and add transparency before regulators are all over them. So I think it's important to show that the community itself can self-regulate. So many people are talking about some kind of self-regulatory uh, body that can evaluate ICOs, that can provide some kind of guidance. I think that could be great because uh, we could show that uh, we can self, we can self, we can self-regulate, and we can provide some kind of framework for the future regulation, which will be supplied by uh, governments and authorities. That that would be awesome. And people have to realize that 90 90 percent of startups fail, and the same applies for ICO startups. It, yeah. it 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 can be different. It's the same. So if in like normal venture investment most of the startups fail, why should it be different with ICO startups? And here we have a different market where like normal people, not like VCs, can invest in those types of startups. That wasn't accessible uh, for them before. And now they have, with token, they have access to that market. Of course, it's, it's like dangerous and some people are going to get burned. It's normal, so because, because it can't be any other way. Because people didn't have access to that kind of investment before, and now they do have it. So we need some kind of regulation here. And what's happening now with China, with SEC, it's like it's good, I think, because it can't be any other way because it will, you know, it can just collapse. Because if there is no regulation and people have access to that kind of investment, people are going to get bored. So what's happening now is good, I think. Uh, just maybe, Miko, I mean, yeah. you, we've already talked about self-regulation and there's yeah. absolute need for it. I mean, I think you, you, you've, Miko, in our discussions before this panel, you, you mentioned that you're already working on icogovernment.org um, as being a, a, a place where, where a company can disclose um, some of the important things. Can you say a little bit about how you see that being a tool to cut through some of the hype? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, just to get the URL, it's icogovernance.org and uh, check it out. It's, we've, we're developing a, essentially a standard protocol for disclosure around the custody chain. So the, the notion is that uh, what we'd love to do is standardize the job of custodians. We're, you know, talking with folks like Consensus, uh, Millennium Trusts, 
kingdom trust. We're talking to folks that are handling traditional institutional grade custody chains. And we're essentially enabling voluntary disclosure through a protocol format called IGF-1. And it's essentially almost an extra governmental regulator construct that's a little bit like an Edgar slash S1 filing for ICOs. So, uh, you know, at the moment it's voluntary, but, you know, we really would love to collaborate. So if anybody's working on self-regulation or self-governance uh, in, in the marketplace, you know, I'd love to uh, speak with you. Uh, my partner, uh, Michael Golub, is also here. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're here to talk to folks about the topic of governance, self-governance and self-regulation. Because I agree with, with Sasha, um, you know, it, it's going to help. It's going to help everyone. So, Richard, you wanted to? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really glad that someone's taking up the torch because it's something that's been bantered around a lot, in, at least in the European community. I know that Jamie and I have talked about this before and we're like, do you want the job? No. <laughs> do you want the job? No. But somebody's got to pick up this torch and say, hey, let's create, you know, let's try and organize this structure that's out there. Because, hey, we do really good. We crowdsource due diligence in the community quite well, surprisingly. You know, if you, if, if you go to Bitcoin Talk, you see people descending on, on ICO announcements and, like, you know, going through the people's, the pictures of the, of the founders and then Googling them and ripping, ripping them apart and, like, going at them. I mean, it, that's the due diligence process that was there from the beginning after a few people got ripped off. They didn't want to get ripped off again. So there's a whole team and community within our, in our community that does this. But we also have third party. We have Smith & Crown, who's, you know, struggling, I think, to keep up with what's going on. We have ICO rating. They haven't really developed their business models yet, so, uh, or maybe they are in development. So there's a real, you know, we've always thought that there would be a, a really interesting project would be for someone to build a self-regulatory uh, uh, project and do an ICO around it and actually have a construct where we use the token to reward people for doing due diligence and helping us uh, figure, you know, do the, do the work that's needed on projects. That's sort of one approach that can be done. There's many ways to come at this, but we need a FINRA. We need a FINMA. We need an organization, or the regulators are going to make the rules, <laughs> and we're not going to have any say in this. And the last thing I want, and I tried to do the file coin, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I did, I, they wanted to talk to my accountant, and my cryptocurrency didn't really matter. And, uh, yeah, I didn't meet the, you know, and they said I had to go through a broker, so I have to go to some guy who doesn't understand ICOs uh, less than I do to, to invest in that project. And, I, I don't want to see it, our, our industry go that strict. I think that's too far. I think the idea that you need to be an accredited investor, you know, it's not like grandmothers are getting ripped off on our industry at the moment. It's not. It's, you know, it's not easy to invest in ICOs. You have to know what, what you're doing. Uh, and a lot of it's just people like us who've made money in the industry putting money back into the industry. So we're lucky. We don't have those horror stories yet, but they will come. The grandmother who, you know, mortgaged her house and, and bought into some crazy project is going to happen at some point. And that's, that's when the SEC comes in, you know, with the, with, the, with the hammers and says, okay, it's going to take one or two of those and that's it. Yeah, so. <clears throat> but the self-regulation, shouldn't it start at the process side, not so much at the forms? So what I hear and see is a lot based on like, taking a US-centric approach, while this is global in nature. Mm -hmm. So, and we do have some... Uh, jurisdictions that close down a little bit, some that are seeking clarity, like the US, and then we have some that are pretty open, Switzerland here. We have some that are very open, uh, like Iron Man recently announced uh, that they, they want to get involved here. Like we have Slovenia, we have Estonia, we know Gibraltar, we know Malta. There is a governmental race also to be first movers right now. Now it's small mm -hmm. nations doing this. When, when the but, grandmother gets yeah. ripped off by a, in a foreign yeah. com country, it doesn't matter. The yeah. SEC will still go after them. Exactly. But then, so unfortunately for you that are based in the US, mm -hmm. like you are <laughs> going to be stuck there. But there's the rest of the world also. Right. Yeah. And they will just move together with these projects to where it makes most sense to set up. And, and so what I hope to build is that these structures and processes are built First, kind of rough, but that makes sense. And then you can go into details in, and, and work out the exact details of how to self-regulate, how are the filings going to be and everything. But, 
But, but I do think that this needs to be collabor collaboration as well. Right now, no one knows. Uh, so looking at the structures that we have in projects and tokens today compared to three months ago, it's all changed. So it will be all changed again in three months. So we really cannot build it uh, uh, towards what we do and have today. Because uh, it doesn't really make sense in the systems that we do have. So, so, let, so. Let, let me just ask this question, right? Because what we see, I mean, you know, this type of acceleration, we've seen it in other places in the history, right? We had a dot-com thing that was happened, and, and, and we had a collateralized debt obligation thing that happened, right? And these things kind of uh, left, left things, right? And you can say, okay, at that time, everything was regulated, right? They were, that was regulated industries. Um, now we're talking about self-regulation, right? Um, is it enough? Is it going to be enough to actually correct uh, the path before, uh, you know, grandma gets ripped off and, and, and uh, the heavy hands of the SEC comes in? Or, or I think the, the international aspect of this, our, our ecosystem makes it highly difficult to regulate, unlike any of the other things that we've seen, perhaps. But, Maybe not the internet, but... Yeah. Yeah, and, and one other thing, is so one in, very interesting dimension to look at the tokenization. No, we're not talking so much about hype anymore, but more about regular, very interesting <coughs> stuff. But one dimension is what is being tokenized and what, is the, what, what are the assets being tokenized. Right now, it makes sense to tokenize crypto assets. Tomorrow, in three months or maybe six months, we will be tokenizing digital assets that could be virtual goods in computer games. Anything else that can be bridged technologically to another system. And those assets now, when we're talking about grandma, like it's probably much more related to what is normal securities, normal, normal assets in real life. And the, when are they going to get tokenized? Yeah, it's the next step after the virtual assets. Uh, so that's also a little bit of a future problem to have the crypto assets we have today. Why are they created? Yeah, it's to create network effects and to create uh, incentivize in networks and, and build blockchain based products really so uh, and all users in those networks like they said earlier now as long as they are promoting a network then it's good it's best if they are very engaged users of that specific platform uh, yeah. so what i mean there's you know probably about 100 ambitious uh, icos maybe in this room even, right? Um, let's imagine a correction's coming. Let's imagine that, you know, this type of acceleration will always kind of have an effect. We saw the Bitcoin price drop a bit, right? Um, for me, it's a buying signal. But I mean, uh, for others, it might be, uh, you know, panic button. Now, you have a lot of people that have maybe, you know, the best team, the, really the one world-saving idea out there. They're about to go into an ICO. It takes six months to really get the circuit right and to get the launch correct. You know, what's the advice from you guys who have seen this from the inside and the outside to somebody in that space, how should they deal with that upcoming potential correction a month, two months before their launch? Mika? So, uh, you know, I have enough gray hair <laughs> to have had skin in the game in 2000 when the dot-com bubble crashed. And in a sense, that crash is part of what gives me energy to go into ICO governance, right? And to try to structure capital formation in an extra-governmental global decentralized way. But I guess what I wanted to say as advice to people who are working on deals of quality is that if there is a correction, there will continue to be deals of quality. And if you actually look at, you know, I was, I've been in Silicon Valley for 25 years and we, I've seen ups and downs and the giant companies of Silicon Valley, for example, are largely built during crashes. Right? Because during a crash, you actually have the availability of talent. You have an incredible availability of, of you know, resources that you can aggregate when you cannot aggregate during a hype bubble. So to me, uh, I think uh, a crash actually is a signifier of a flight to quality. Uh, you know, so, so my mindset would be, you know, if, you're, if your shit is good, like, you don't need to rush. Right. You know, we'll find you and we'll invest in you. <laughs> yeah, I would like to add. So people are now trying to be very opportunistic. They can see the opportunity. There's like free money and they are just want to tap into that market and just raise some funds 
uh, they see that that market might be uh, going away soon, and they're trying to actually get the money right here, right now. It's always bad because it's still risky. Uh, SEC can be after you. They can pick some project out, might be quite small, and go after them. Just as an example, it might be dangerous, guys, if you want to raise money and don't care about the legality. Yeah, because. I've been in this market since years. I've done ICOs like three years ago, so I, like, I've seen that all actually. So don't try to be too opportunistic because it might just close down any time, and you might be like in jail, guys. It is possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. someone's going to go, go to jail for sure. Yeah. So yeah. just as an example. Yeah, uh, and so. <coughs> there's no free money. I, Absolutely. It's yeah. really hard work. I mean, and. Also, some of the like what we can say is that I think you've seen it too. It's very binary. Uh, if you do a project, there are lots of projects out there, uh, but there are, there are no free money, and you must work really, really hard on this. Like now, I had my three main topics, but on the community building side, especially, that's where you need to get your hands very dirty and and spend a lot of hours online and offline with people because you're building a grassroots crowd uh, and a big community with supporters and they have to be engaged and believe in what you're doing and you have to build it globally uh, and if you don't do that then you end up being one of those projects that just don't raise anything it just there's a ico that's open and nothing happened and there are lots of those as well i i think we're talking about hype so for me there's kind of two types of hype and this is really kind of a uh you know hype is well it, it, it's an interesting word but uh, there's the kind of hype that comes with like spending a whole lot of money on marketing and like getting in front of people's faces and gosh, they're everywhere. We've seen this on Facebook, right? If anybody has blockchain as a, or ICO as a, as a keyword. Um, but the real, the real magic, I think, ha comes in the hype of, uh, uh, of being able to build this kind of, let's call it viral level of hype where people are talking about you and it's like, have you seen this? This is great. I think Aragon was a great example of that. They built this awesome community. They spent zero money on advertising, pretty much. Uh, I've talked to the founders of it, and they just, they, they, they nailed it on their ICO. Great product. They didn't barely advertise, but they had the community done. And the problem with a lot of ICO products I see is, uh, you know, a lot of them are led by really, really smart people with, with very high IQs. They're coders or developers, a lot of them. Uh, but they don't necessarily have the social acumen or the skills to, like, really manage a community or even want to get their hands in that. They're like, I just want to build stuff and... You know, they kind of ignore that side. But that's, uh, when I look at a great example of, of, of Bancor, for instance, who went and built their community and the three founders were in there every day answering the questions, the same questions over and over, building the Q&A base, sending people. That's what made them successful. That's why they raised $150 million. Plus, they were willing to go out there and get, you know, stomp and go to the events and set their own events up and going to meetup groups in Amsterdam and going to meetup groups in in London, and, and you know, you, it is work. It's hard work. If you want a successful ICO, the money's, you know, it's not like build and they will come. That doesn't work. But I, I want a quick quick comment, which is, <clears throat> you know, in my mind, successful ICO should not be the benchmark. Uh, we should be looking for successful companies. You know, it, one, one case study I want to mention is uh, Omisego. Very cool company, raised $25 million. So... For a quality team, that's actually a pretty modest amount. But if you actually look at their current total market capitalization of token, it's close to one billion USD. So to me, that's a really nice case study of a way that you can do it. It's, uh, it's funny because as a VC, you talk about companies, but as an op as a, as a guy that comes from the open source world, I talk about foundations. So it's fundamentally kind of two different things in a way. Uh, I, I think a successful ICO project is a foundation-led open source product, which is the antithesis of what VC really want. They want intellectual property for the most part, and they want a corporate structure where there's going to be a profit to give a return to their shareholders. When, in the ICO world, it's the antithesis, antithesis of that. The only space I see for the VC in this, in this space is providing the expertise. And secondly, they want in on the pre-ICO is where the most arbitrage is. And they can actually have liquidity, which they don't get necessarily in investing into a, into a unicorn or where they've got 100 million sitting and waiting for the exit or the, you know, the IPO. Uh, this is, it's, so it's very interesting from their perspective. But I think what we need to do with ICO is also a successful ICO 
in the future should have smart contracts written with the vesting in it that only goes when certain benchmarks are met for the project itself that forces the, 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 the founders of the project, so the board of the foundation is the one setting these rules for the projects to meet their milestones, and then the money gets released. And I think that's going to be a really effective way of building these new, uh, I'm not going to call them companies, I will call them you know, open source foundations in the future. But one more thing. So what I say uh, or think about when it comes to a successful crowd say, <clears throat> is to know what is your minimum viable network and how do you set that up? And one crucial part of it is the starting community. And that's what you reach with the crowd sale. Uh, so it's like the initial user acquisition. Uh, and that's really important. My minimum viable network. What is that and how soon can you release that after you have your crowd sale? Have that very open. I, I yeah. think you could do some pretty interesting things around creating art artificial scarcity. I think yeah. a whitelist mm -hmm. does that very well. People feel like they need to rush mm -hmm. in and get in because mm -hmm. there's a limited space available. Uh, that's proving to be a very effective technique, I think, for the last few ICOs that I think are going to do well. Uh, you know, making it seem like, hey, you know, I have to sign up for this because it's, it's, it's not, you know, it, 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 there's some scarcity here. Uh, that seems to be, I was quite amazed at Kyber Network, you know, they, had, they ended up building a whitelist of 50,000 people. That's pretty phenomenal. And, I mean, even like three times the amount of Kick. And I thought Kick was going to be huge. So yeah. uh, some of the new <laughs> strategies are really interesting in how people are building these minimal viable communities or MVCs, I guess we can call them. Yeah, so I mean, that's, uh, I, mean I think we've heard some, some, some good tools, right? Uh, almost kind of a toolkit that you can work with. You know, you've got the, you've got the white label, you've got the self-regulatory uh, compliance that you can put out there. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very strong supporter of smart contracts and releasing funding in tranches, right? Because that is, that is something that you can look for in an ICO. You've obviously got caps and floors. And just to maybe as a closing point, um, is there any other tools that you guys would recommend for people who, you know, who, who aren't maybe as tapped into the network but still have an eye on investing I'll start, and, and uh, I'll just give you some tools that you should not use. Uh, please get away from Slack and Telegram. It may sound crazy, but there's so many very, very, very talented uh, social hackers, social engineers that are fishing in these communities and ripping off people to the tune of hundreds of thousands of euro. They're disguising themselves as, 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 uh, uh, as, as leaders of the community. They're giving out addresses in, in messaging. It's impossible for the, the founders, of the, uh, you know, the community leaders, to get rid of people very easily. You know, so look at something like Discord, or uh, is, is uh, I think where you can get rid of people very easily. You can control privacy for the people that are in there. Don't run your whitelists and your in your communities together. Uh, I've just seen a lot of this happening. Uh, people putting up like you know, oh, emergency! The the, the 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 there's a new Ether address because the website's too busy because of the ICO. Uh, you know, with a very thinly disguised name of, of one of the moderators, and then people losing like a hundred thousand dollars worth of Ether uh, within. 20 seconds. So you really try and manage that. Uh, that's that part of it. Find the right tool to build your community. And I, I don't think Slack is the right one. Telegram is getting closer. But Yeah, and don't rush it. I mean, <clears throat> you build this over time. It, it takes time to, to structure it uh, on the legal side, on the community side, to build your business model and your token model. Like There are so many things to go in and do it, do it right. That's, that's my point. Uh, yeah, I think for the projects, uh, my advice would be to do some kind of uh, KYC AML. I don't think it can hurt your crowd sale can better because you can turn it some, into some kind of marketing as people do now with whitelists. It doesn't hurt their crowd sales. So it's totally fine to do KYC and AML and you'll be safer and it will be even good for your marketing in some way. And for the investors, I think it's important to invest in things that you understand. You have to understand why this token... Uh, could grow in value. Otherwise, just don't invest and just stay away. You have to understand what you invest in. Otherwise, uh, don't tr trust any, any rating agencies. Try, try to understand why this project could work potentially. That would be my advice. So as far as tool chain, I'll try to keep it very brief. So icogovernance.org, uh, consider filing IGF-1. Very useful tool. The other tool that I want to recommend is uh, my friend Jackson Palmer, who is the founder of Dogecoin created actually a Slack plugin that prevents phishing attacks. So, uh, you know, you can also just email me 
miko at miko.com i'm happy to kind of give you the, the skinny on on how to get that so you know it is it's a way of avoiding chain just the final notice chain analysis uh actually did a study on ico fishing and their estimate is is that 250 million u.s dollars have been lost to ico fishing so it's a it's a thing it's a file coin size thing so you know be careful out there yeah, brilliant. Okay, guys, I think we're out of time. I don't want to keep anybody from their lunch. Thank you very much. It's been a really in interesting discussion. Huh? Uh, thanks. Thanks. Thank you also from my side. Um, just a quick note. Uh, there's going to be flying lunch, so there will be lunch all around you in the back area and outside. Uh, please be back by 1.30 when we continue with another panel. Thank you so much and enjoy lunch. <laughs>